So today's lecture about In Time, the movie starring uh, Justin Timberlake and Olivia Wilde. It, the movie really speaks to class dynamics in America in ways that we can understand. Um, so one of the things that I like to explain to everybody in this class is, or in this course, is what class means. And most people don't have, in America, don't have a good idea about what class means. And the key here is, in America, almost everybody likes to say that they are, in fact, in the middle class. But if we were sitting here, all 120 of you, and I polled you on what does it mean to be middle class, I would get 120 different responses about what it means. The way people generally think about class and about the middle class is income brackets. And when I say, hey, what's the middle class? Most people um, start throwing out numbers to me. Some of the numbers I've heard in the past or anything from, I've had students say, middle class is if you make uh, between forty and sixty thousand dollars, or and then somebody else might say, "Well, I think it might be if you make between forty and a hundred thousand." And then you might hear somebody say, "Oh, I think it's you know thirty to seventy thousand." And all of these are reasonable. We could talk in terms of what sociologists and economists consider that middle bracket. Um, but if we start thinking in those terms, then what I want to argue to you is we always fail. We always fail to understand the nuance and differences between how different people experience reality. So in any given election year, most candidates like to discuss the American middle class and how it's succeeding, how it's failing, what we can do to improve the middle class, what we can do to bring more people into the middle class. The thing here is that everybody thinks of themselves as middle class. Um, the only candidate that ever talks about a working class is Bernie Sanders. He did this in 2016. He was doing it again this year. Um, you'll often hear people talk, say things like working people. Well, isn't everybody in America working? And this is part of the rhetoric about mid the middle class. We don't have the kind of class system in the common reality that a lot of people try to, to think about uh, when they think about like America overthrowing the British Empire, right? You had the aristocratic class uh, that was um, the, roy the, the royal family in England. We got rid of that and we have democracy and so now we have um, the middle class. But in actuality, even if you think about it, Trump, before he became president, he worked. He had a job. He does things. George W. Bush, he worked. He had a job. He does things. George W. Bush was born into an aristocratic family, as was Donald J. Trump. Um, so how can we think about that? We think about it in terms of, well, they do work. There are a lot of wealthy people in America that don't work, but even the wealthy like to feel like they're doing something. Look at Mike Bloomberg, right? Um, uh, Bill Gates. All these people, they keep going and they, they do things. But we do have a class system. And the fact that they do, those wealthy people do do things points to their class status. And their, or not their class status, but their class group. Um, middle class, if we talk about it in income brackets, we always will fail. Um, to go along with this, after people throw out many different income brackets, they'll often then move to, oh, well, middle class is an idea. It's living the American dream. Do I have enough money to buy a home? Do I have enough money to have two cars, right? Do I have this money that represents that I've succeeded in life? 
Well, now if we get into the American dream, we get into it an even more problematic ideology. So, um, what I hope to do in this lesson is to make you think about what class is. Um, because when we start thinking about what is not the middle class, it becomes even more disturbing. So, I think one of the, the shorthands that we often use is the top 1%. It's been this for the past 11 years. We talk about the top 1%. Well, the top 1% is a fun thing to throw out there, but the top 1% of income earners earn $250,000 a year, um, or 300000 as a couple. That means that in a class of 120 students at the University of Texas at Arlington, there's a good chance that none of you will earn uh, or be part of the 1%. You probably wouldn't be a UTA if, if you were on that path. So you've also got to take into effect right, that if you go to Harvard, Harvard, there's a greater likelihood that you'll be in the top 1%. Now, somebody in here might be. There might be more than one of you that ends up in the top 1%. Um, but it's also something to think about. And now my dog is making uh, her way into the room. Um, I'm going to close the door again. Okay, I'm back post uh, Hazel running in here. What I was saying was $250,000 is both a lot of money and also nowhere near as much money as the people that are in the top 0.01% or the 0.001%. Right? These are astronomically different class statuses themselves. But then even that really obscures things. So to, what I want to get across to you is that there are other ways to think about class. And we can think about different classes as well, which we'll get into in a second. I'm going through the Prezi as I look through here. So class in terms of this popular culture course is defined as a group of people sharing common relationship relations to labor and the means of production. So what this asks is how do people labor? How do people work? How do people earn money? And do they earn, own the means of production? The means of production is the tools or instruments and the raw material you use to create something. That's the means of production. So do you own the tools that you can make something? Or, you know, if you are a shoemaker, shoemakers are the classic example. Do you own the shoemaker shop with all the tools in it? Uh, do you own the leather and the rubber and the yarn that you use to make the shoe? Or does somebody else own it and you work for that person? So this becomes the question about what your class is. So class is a, about shared interests, the common relationship to labor. It's not about how much money you have, but rather how you make So what does it mean to have shared interests? That means it's a far more political question. Um, your shared interests are, uh, say, if you are um, a worker at the GM factory, uh, that you're going to be paid a fair wage, that you're going to have some kind of health care in America, that you're going to have hours that are reasonable and if you have to work longer hours you're going to have overtime right so those people that work in that job they have these shared interests but then you see those shared interests across different areas and that helps define what class you're in so if you think about something like corporate tax cuts my guess is that corporate tax cuts don't affect anybody in my class or you wouldn't be taking my class because you'd be out working in corporate America. 
um, you don't have that interest, right? But you do have a common interest of wanting cheaper or free education because you're students, right? See, these are different interests that different classes of people. You're the class of students. Um, and you're probably also uh, potentially workers as well that um, you might be doing working full-time to pay for your college. Right? So these are different things that, that point to this. So what I want you to think about here, and this is the important concept, the labor theory of value. The labor theory of value is the idea that all value is derived from labor. Labor, here's a great quote for you, labor creates all wealth. Labor creates all wealth. Wealth doesn't create all wealth, labor creates all wealth. And the labor theory of value is the idea that the way wealth is actually created is by taking money from workers that they should be earning, it's taken away from them and it becomes wealth. So under the labor theory of value, labor is a commodity. We sell our labor for a price, and that price is known as a wage, if we do not own the means of production. If we do not own the means of production, and we're selling our labor at a price, at a wage, excuse me, we never get the full value of our labor. Whoever owns that business gets the full value of our labor. And so what we call that, the difference between the value of labor and wage is called surplus value. Now, if we think in these terms and we think of the idea that how we work is tied to our class, there are a number of different classes. So if we talk in Marxian terms, um, the Two biggest classes under capitalism are the bourgeoisie, or capitalist class, and the worker class. The worker class is identified by those who earn a wage to meet their ends. And everything is about meeting your basic needs. So let me rewind. Your basic needs and your social needs. These are the things that need to be met. So in capitalist society, how do we meet our needs? Well, we meet our needs um, generally by going and working and purchasing, using or going to work, getting a wage, and purchasing things to meet our needs. In a uh, worker, hunter, gatherer society, hunters and gatherers go hunt, they gather, they build the stuff that they need, they don't pay somebody else. They're all closely connected. Um, so to meet their needs, they do it on their own. Now, my guess is most people in my class, including myself, if we were to go outside in Arlington, Texas, would have no idea how to survive without paying for our food. So there are plenty of herbs and different um, plants that are edible. There's animals, squirrels, armadillos. Uh, coyotes, deer, that you could eat, right? How do you go about eating them? Well, I know I can eat those animals, okay? But what plant can I eat? I know I had um, dewberry in a house I used to live in. There were dewberry vines growing on the ground. And I, I tried some. They were okay. They weren't great. But that's a wild plant that, that was around here. But we're disconnected from that reality. Our reality is we earn a wage, we go to Kroger, we buy our food, we come home, we eat it. So food is one, uh, clearly. You've got shelter. And one of the things about living in Arlington, Texas, or anywhere in America, really, is you have to pay personal property tax or you have to pay rent to live somewhere unless you're homeless. And even that, you are abused by the system if you're homeless, by being thrown out of areas. The point I'm trying to make is you always have to pay for housing. 
uh, one of the great tragedies of home makeover are makeover home edition or i'm sorry extreme makeover home edition there we go uh they would go and they would rehab these houses on tv this reality tv show and when people would go to live in that house a lot of times what they would do is they'd knock down build this big beautiful house for these people who were in need but when they moved in they couldn't pay the taxes on that house. And then all of a sudden they're evicted from this beautiful house that the TV show made for them because you still have to pay taxes. So there's no way to like, live on the, in America without participating in this wage system because the only way that you can pay for your housing is by going and working and getting a wage to go then and pay for your housing. Um, So, under capitalism, we have the workers. Workers work for a wage that they then use that wage to pay for food. Um, the bourgeoisie, or the capitalist class, they have other people work for them. And they take the surplus value from them. They uh, reinsert it back into the economic system and try to generate more and more capital. Capital is the endless accumulate, or capitalism is the endless accumulation of capital. Capital is a social condition that, um, or it, it represents a social relationship. It represents that taking of money. So when we talk about capital, we're not just talking about dollar bills. We're talking about this uh, congealed labor, as it's called, in, in the surplus value. So those are two classes. Uh, you've always got the aristocracy, which is kind of the landed elite, right? They inherit their money. That's how their class is positioned. You have what's called the pro uh, lumpen proletariat or underclass, people who generally live in urban areas that don't have jobs. This has been a phenomenon in uh, cities for centuries, millennia. It's that surplus population that has to kind of work on the black market to find ways to make ends meet. But then we can go even further. We can talk about um, a farming class. A farming class is like a small farmer that owns their farm and they farm it and they don't pay other people. A bigger industrial farm pays farm workers. Now a farm worker is the working class because they earn a wage for the work that they do, even though it's often even a crappier wage. Um, you've got peasants. Peasants are actually kind of like farm workers, but instead of working for a wage, they, they could be peasants or serfs, sharecroppers. They work the land for somebody else that they live on, and in turn, uh, for being able to live on that land, they give a portion of what they grow back to their landlord, hence the name landlord, which is often that aristocratic class. Um, Slave labor is another class. It's a class that's forced labor. They don't get paid uh, for their work. They're forced into labor, and um, they're given what the owner class thinks that they need for paying for things. So we have all these different classes. Um, so the problem in America is we we talk about these classes, but we don't, or we talk about the middle class, we talk about the quote-unquote working class, and we talk about, say, the 1%, but we don't talk in these terms. And so it does get a little confusing. So let's take high-paid athletes, for instance. High-paid athletes are, in fact, workers. They work for a team owner, that is the bourgeois. Oh, and I forgot one other good class. The petite bourgeoisie. The petite bourgeoisie are small business owners. They think of themselves as little capitalists, but they're not really. Oftentimes, they end up being workers in the end because 
99% of small businesses fail or the owner works and works their whole life and they never get a break and they never get ahead and they work just as hard as any worker. Um, so that's another thing. But back to the um, uh, high paid athletes. They earn a wage for doing a job. Their class position changes as soon as they start investing those million dollars into something else. So if you take Carl Malone, for instance, known as the mailman, a uh, famous basketball player for the, for the Utah Jazz back in the 90s. Um, Carl Malone went and bought a chain of car dealerships or created his own chain of car dealerships. At that point, he becomes bourgeoisie. So that's where the difference happens, right? But keep in mind, right, the NFL has gone on strikes. The Major League Baseball players have gone on strikes. That is them as uh, workers. So now, the important thing here to talk about is the idea of class warfare. You'll often hear anytime somebody wants to talk about class I'm from a working class position, people will say, well, that's class warfare. Um, the crux of it, though, is if you come at this from the labor theory of value angle, um, because workers are constantly being paid less for their labor than its true value, they are perpetually exploited. This is class warfare, but only one side is fighting. It's the capitalist fighting the bourgeoisie. It's that easy. Um, so that's why I played uh, In Time for you, or I wanted you to watch In Time. Um, because in In Time, you see that, number one, class is represented by time zone. People are restricted in their movements, which is not different from places in America where you have the physical distancing, you have um, people who can't go to certain areas, whether that's through a gated community or um, a lack of uh, capital to move somewhere. Um, right? If buses don't go somewhere and you're poor and you're you need a bus or some other form of public transportation to travel, then you're limited to where the public transportation goes. Um, so we have that divide. Uh, what stands for wage in the film is actually time, right? So the people have time printed on their arm. Right? They turn it, they can lose their time, they pay for things like that, uh, but they earn time. And it's a real stark way to think about this. In America, it's no different. If you work hard and you work two 40-hour week minimum wage jobs, you're working 80 hours a week, you never get ahead. You barely pay your bills. And that's the situation that the people in um, what is it, Dayton in, in time face. So I want you to think about this discussion of class and Try to think through how that applies to end time.